In 2005, Sean Askinosi left a successful career as a criminal defense lawyer to start a bean to bar chocolate factory and never looked back. Askinosi Chocolate is a small batch award winning chocolate factory located in Springfield, Missouri, sourcing 100% of their beans directly from farmers on four continents. Recently named by Forbes as one of the 25 best small companies in America, Askinosi Chocolate has been featured in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, on Bloomberg, MSNBC, and other numerous national and international media outlets. The Askinosi Chocolate mission is to serve their farmers, their neighborhood, their customers, and each other, sharing the Askinosi Chocolate experience by leaving the world a better place than they found it. Sean joins our conversation today as we talk about his book, Meaningful Work, The Quest to Do Great Business, Find Your Calling, and Feed Your Soul. Hi, I'm Ashton Gustafson, and this is Good, True, and Beautiful. Hey guys, Ashton Gustafson here, and welcome back. I am thrilled, excited, honored, uh, super ecstatic today to introduce you guys um, to an individual that, to be honest with you, seven days ago, I wasn't aware uh, of him and his work in the world. Um, but Seth Godin sent an email out and said, if you want to read a book that's going to change the way you approach life and business and relationships, you need to read this book. So I got this book in the mail, Meaningful Work. I looked up the author. His name was Sean Askinosi. He's the founder and CEO of Askinosi Chocolate, has an amazing background and story that's led him to where he is today. And uh, I just can't say enough good things about these words that he's put into the world. For me personally, uh, in my journey, I feel like this is going to be a book I revisit uh, multiple times throughout my life. And that being said, he he offered some some generous time and he said he'd chat with us and I just am so excited to introduce Sean Askinosi to the show today. Sean, welcome. Thank you so much, Ashton. It's an honor to have this chance to speak with you. Well, I am I am so excited, and there's a million ways I would love to take this conversation. Um, but but before we kind of get into this, where where do you begin when you introduce yourself and your work in the world? I begin by uh, including that I used to be a criminal defense lawyer and I loved it and then I stopped loving it and now I make <laughs> chocolate and I get the chance to travel to meet farmers and um, develop relationships with them and work with them and that's what I do. And so this, um, you know, as many of us do at some point, these jobs and lives that we lead, they they hit a wall where we aren't finding uh, the meaning and purpose that maybe we once did um, and, and this led you to like this bean to bar chocolate company, this, this, uh, amazing movement, uh, that's kind of happened recently. How, why chocolate? How, how did you, what, what was it that led you from being at this incredibly successful defense attorney to saying, you know what, I'm going to do a craft startup chocolate company. <laughs> the, for me, it was about a five year process between the point at which I, said to myself, I can't do this anymore. Not because I didn't believe in it or love it, but just I'd done it for 20 years and, and high stakes criminal law and specialized in, in serious felony cases and murder. And, uh, you, you know, when you're doing that job with everything you've got, you can only do it for so long. And so I, I reached this point and then I took, I still practiced, still worked really hard, but it was a five year process between, man, I need to do something else. And hey, I think I'll start a chocolate factory. And um, so the book is really about that space between decision and action. And what I'm trying to do is encourage people to not just look at my story. Oh, isn't this an interesting story? Some guy was a lawyer and now he's a chocolate maker. Uh, because candidly, there are a million stories like that out there. Uh, and frankly, it's one of the reasons why I didn't write a book sooner. Hmm. Um, and that is because what I'm trying to do is let readers and hopefully today your listeners see themselves yeah. in this story. <laughs> and that 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 is um, 
I think, a greater challenge to tell the story that way. And so for me, it was, you know, there, was, there were a lot of things between those spaces of, of I can't do this anymore and chocolate. If, if, if the question is why chocolate, I honestly have no idea. I mean, I, <laughs> I didn't know anything about chocolate. I didn't know how to make anything. Yeah. I took zero business classes, um, unlike you. Um, and I didn't, I took, I didn't take any accounting classes and all I knew was the courtroom. And so mm-hmm. what I first did is I started, um, uh, praying and it was a simple prayer every day, which went like this. Dear God, please give me something else to do. And I said that sometimes I said it 10 times a day yeah. and uh, sometimes just once. But then I had no idea it would be five years. But during that time, I started some hobbies. I bought a big green egg and I started making things outside, grilling. Then I started baking. Then I started making chocolate desserts, having zero idea um, where chocolate came from. I thought it was just you know some substance that was melted and poured into a mold literally had no idea then uh on my mind on my way to a funeral of a distant relative just driving by myself and this idea pops in my head hey how about making chocolate from scratch now remember at this time nobody was doing it right uh no one had started a company except Scharfenberger. and um i and anyway within three months of that light bulb i was in the amazon uh, still wow. practicing law, but learning from farmers how they influence the flavor of beans by how they harvest them. And then I went back and started taking the time to wind down my law practice, buy a building, um, start acquiring equipment, and you know that. And I was I was off to the races. So wow. that is, and it, depending on how detailed you want, there there's some there were some um, I would say critical points during those five years which allowed me to even consider the possibility of something yeah. like that because I had no idea about it. But anyway, that's the, that's the sort of medium length version of the story. Well, and I, and, and you got an email from me that basically said you are mirroring back to me something I've been trying to understand. And, and that's how do I immerse my true self into the business world? How, how do I marry um, this, this union between, um, you know, wanting to be a gift to the world, but also needing to be profitable. And you go out and you read Jean Veneer and Parker J. Palmer and Richard Rohr and Thomas Keating. And sometimes you're like, I don't even know, I don't know how to marry these two worlds, but I know that they must, they must marry somehow. You know, how do we put this heaven and earth existence together? And for our listeners that, that is what this book does. It, it shows you the both and. It shows you um, how to remain in the true self and at the same time go out and lead a profitable business, a career that means something. Um, and so that was your intention. And, and just from me to you, thank you. You did it. And, wow. and it woke me up thank in you. a beautiful way. Um, you talk about like personal vocation and business lo- uh, vocation. And, and you say how your personal vocation will lead you to your business vocation. You want to hold my hand on kind of what exactly you mean by that? Yes. And I think um, in, in this instance, I'm, I'm speaking to entrepreneurs or, or students. Uh, I do a lot of speaking to high school and college students. And so what I'm, what I'm saying is here is that let's presume for a minute that you don't have a business, but you want to start a business or you want to leave your business, start another business or, and that, that's, that's who I'm speaking to. And what I'm saying is, is that if you can, if you can work, do the work on developing your personal vocation, your life vocation, how you live your life, what's important to you in your life. And you can begin to sort of get some clarity with what that personal, we can call it vocation, we can call it calling, purpose. Um, and I think Parker Palmer and Thomas Merton, you know, do a great job at outlining what that means. Yep. But but I I my 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 thing is is then okay, if you understand this is how I'm gonna live my life, this is what I believe, then I think it's it's a, a very natural, organic thing to sort of macrame that into what you do during the work day and you know the the smarter people than me say that it's 
we're going to spend on average 80,000 hours at work <laughs> before we die. And so it's really important that we make our work meaningful. And that doesn't mean that we have to have a fancy title or even a fancy company. It means that we have to find a way to bring dignity to the things that we do during the day. And so this process of this is my personal calling, this is my vocation, and then taking threads from that, pulling threads from that to how we uh, behave in our business life and the things that we do in our business life, um, to me, those are um, part and parcel of each other. And in many ways, they're inseparable. Absolutely. And so um, I, I guess walk me through, you know, can, like, can you say your personal vocation? Um, like, I know you end the book with the rule of life, your rule of life, and we'll get to that. But like, can you say, hey, this is who I am, why I'm here. And now here's how this connects the dots via a craft chocolate company in Missouri. Well, um, I can say it in the in, in, in the way that I say it in the book. And that is, the, and this is for me, I'm not suggesting this as a prescription right. for someone right. else. And I'm not here to uh, win souls, um, shall we say, yeah. but for me, uh, the, the reason that I have a rule of life at all is to live, to live a life of practice yeah. that allows me to love God. Yeah. And so if I can have a practice that's part of my life, um, that incorporates that into my life to get better at loving God, then the idea is that the sort of circles, the concentric circles that reach out from that point are going to mean uh, it's going to inform how I treat my friends, how I have a heightened awareness of needs of others near, near me, um, and how I behave in business. And so to me, that's, that is my personal vocation. My personal vocation is to 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 be to have the chance to become a truer and truer version of myself mm, and uh, and so that's that's the way I'm and so it's not a, a destination I say it's this process that we're just kind of weaving in, in and out of and some days we can get it pretty close to right on and other days not so much and uh, that so that's how I that's what I would say my personal vocation is and Tell me, has has your experience been that that this has helped facilitate you to be able to detach from whatever the ego may hold on to as far as business acumen, business title? Like I, I saw one of your interviews, and you were basically saying, I, "I just happen to run this chocolate company." Like that can all change. It can be something else. Um, you're this, you know, you defining that vocation, that rule of life. Um, it, it really allows you some freedom and some space to navigate your days to where you don't just sit on your high horse and go, yeah, I'm the CEO of this chocolate company. You, you, you hold that a lot looser. Is that right? I hold it looser. And I love the way you put that because I, I really, really love the way you put that because I, my, one of, one of my personal goals is to not grip or hold tightly to mm. anything. Yeah. And um, that is not an exclusively Christian principle, obviously. Right. Right. And many, many faith practices right. um, suggest this. And so what I, what I would say is that, um, and I believe that, that this principle that I'm going to mention is um, something that we need to really f rejuvenate in the business world and in leadership, and that is humility. Mm. Um, and so what some of those um, times of humility are forced upon us, and in others, we, we understand uh, that they are there and present, and we go forward anyway. For example, I mean, as a lawyer, I made a ton of money, and I was, I was definitely on the up escalator in my career. And I made an intentional choice to make a lot less money. <laughs> and, you know, it's one thing to say it yeah. or yeah. to put it even on a spreadsheet and look at it and think, hmm, wow. But when you live it for 10 years or more with a family, yeah. I might add, you know, 
That's a whole other proposition. Yeah. And the reason I'm bringing it up here is because it's a, it is an intentional way for you to practice humility yeah. because you have no choice. I mean, it's yeah. not like I could just start trying cases again. Yeah. Uh, and, and so, so I think that those opportunities to practice humility um, give us this chance to not hold tightly to things or to de detach, as you say. Yeah. And um, right. I mean, I could be, it could be anything. I could have another kind of company. I could have another product. I could have a service and it would be the same. I, I would be doing the same kinds of things. Yeah. Yeah. The canvas just happens to be a chocolate company right now. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, you also write about how really owning that vocation, being able to say what it is, tattooing it on your heart, that also leads to minim minimizing your distractions. Um, explain that. Cause I think that's huge. I think in a world where we chase every opportunity, we scale, we grow, we do all that. You have beautifully said, no, no, no. We're, there's, there's so few things that we're going to do and we're going to pursue these few things in this way. Um, hold my hand with that concept of vocation, minimizing your distractions. The, the thing about vocation and distraction is um, what we need to do is, is we need to examine that against what people call mission creep. Hmm. Um, and um, I hear about it all the time. And so what vocation, when you understand your vocation, mission creep is really not a problem. And, uh, but it is a problem in many companies. Small and large organizations face this kind of issue every day. And what I'm suggesting is, is that if you as a company understand your collective calling, your purpose, and you've written it down and you've talked about it and you've even written a vision for it as a company, then the distractions um, that in some ways may be very good opportunities um, are really analyzed more as opportunities um, and it takes a lot less time to analyze them because if they don't fit yeah. your calling, then you can easily look away. The problem is that when we don't really have a complete grasp of where we're going, how we, how we uh, feel like we fit into the bigger story of our company and what we're doing, then the problem is, is those temptations are awfully shiny. Yeah. They distract us. They want, we, we, we want to move toward them because they are tempting. And then we are, before we know it, we're down a rabbit hole, wasting yeah. time. Yeah. Now, the other, the other thing I would say about that is, is that it also, if you can do that, it allows you the opportunity to sort of what, you know, when we say we want to go deep and not wide. And so it allows us to deepen the relationships that we have perhaps in the supply chain or with customers um, or other people at work, then um, just feel like that breadth is the most important thing. So what we want to do at my little company of 17 full-time people is, is to have these opportunities of depth, not breadth. And that goes to the other, and we can get to scale and reverse scale yeah. if you want. But yes, yeah. for sure. We will definitely get there. Um, and would you invite our listeners, if, if they hear vocation and they're like, ah, not for me, um, a key guy, uh, the thing that gets you out of bed, uh, your your big why. Like, th this is really the idea that we're drilling down on vocation about. I know that sometimes people may think some of the vernacular lingro, lingo is too, I hate to use religious. the word, religious, woo-woo, some may call it. Um, yeah. <laughs> but, like, really, you're just saying, no, like, what gets you out of bed? Why are you doing this? Um, it, 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 it has to seep over. If it's just for you... Um, that, that's not necessarily the story worth telling. No. And here's the thing as entrepreneurs, we need to first do this for ourselves. We need to do yes. it for our own soul. Yes. And as you and I were talking about before we recorded, we have a responsibility to our own bodies, to our own, um, health, yep. mental, emotional, spiritual, physical and when our bodies are telling us in one of those languages um hey there's a problem um even a slight problem hopefully we can wake up and understand what's happening before it's too late or before it gets too serious so we need to do it for ourselves yeah. and so i encourage people look 
if the word or the label or the thing troubles you, then I would just say, give us a chance, um, look a little deeper and see if that speaks to you. And it, will it help you improve your own life uh, physically or emotionally or spiritually? And so what I encourage people to think about is first, you've got to take care of yourself, right? I mean, yeah. we need to, we need to put the oxygen mask on us, yeah. then yeah. our children. Yeah. And so then the second thing is you, if as an entrepreneur, if this sounds new age to you or overly religious or whatever, think about this. We must develop some kind of story that we can all pull toward bigger than ourselves and our companies not just for ourselves, but for our employees. Yeah. We have to do it for them. Why? Because Gallup says one in three people don't like their job. Mm -hmm. I mean, two in three people don't like their job, aren't engaged. And, and, and the problem is it's getting worse, not better. Yeah. And if our, if our employees, if two or two out of three employees aren't engaged in their job, meaning they essentially don't care about, then what's going to happen to our companies? I mean, before we know it, our our company will have veered off course so severely that it won't be correctable. And so I, I feel like we, we owe it to our employees, even if not to ourselves, yeah. that we need to do it for our companies. It's, it, it really is this, the survival of our companies. And we know that this is true. Just we, we can see it all around us. People want, they want to go to work for something mm -hmm. bigger than themselves. And we have a responsibility to give that to them. And the third thing is, is that if we don't do something about this, it's going to hurt our economy. Yeah. Ultimately, we will we will become less competitive as an economy if we don't find a way to right this ship. And then the last thing is that I think this I I believe that these kinds of notions and the people you've talked about Parker Palmer and and others that if we don't find a way to weave this into business, that ultimately we will see the demise of capitalism. Mm -hmm. And I know that sounds dramatic, but I, I believe that we are in the midst of a true evolution of capitalism by, by in many ways, by force and in some ways by revolution. Um, and and I, I'd like to think that my little company, you know, we're just one, as, as Jean Vanier says, you know, we're a little light. That's all I expect to be. Yep. And, and so I think we can join with other lights to be part of this evolution of capitalism, which I think is a beautiful process. Yes. So that's, sorry, that's a long answer no. to your question, but that's, that's my take on it. No, that's brilliant and so insightful and very well said. And chapter two is called develop, develop a business vocation or else it just might kill your business. And <laughs> the both end of that is, we could also write a chapter that says develop a personal vocation or it just might kill your soul. It, you know, yeah. if, if you don't have both of these, and I'm living example, hashtag 2012, <laughs> of what mm -hmm. happens when um, you are not operating from that, uh, that inner space, that seat of the soul, that little light. Figure it out, does, you know, discover it within yourself, and then allow it to permeate through business. Um, Many people have said, you know, that the best thing you can offer the world is a healthy you. Um, and that's, oh, I love and, that. And sometimes, sometimes that just starts by naming, you know, me at my best, at my most divine point of health is this. Love it. Um, yeah. I could do this all day. Um, okay. So here's the deal both and, you know, when we talk about resisting the traditional dualistic view, um, I always dance around the topic of, you know, non-dualistic consciousness and things like that, and nobody brings it up in business. And then you dive into it in this book, and I'm like, who is Sean Askinosi? I'm getting in my car and driving to Missouri <laughs> to spend time with this guy. This is blowing my Come mind. On. <laughs> Come on. Yes, I will. Um, so resisting the traditional dualistic view, y'all have a phrase uh, and many phrases. One of them is, it's not about the chocolate. It's about the chocolate. And then another one is, our chocolate business supports our vocation, and our vocation supports our chocolate business, which supports our vocation. You want to walk with me on the essence of leaving a mindset of either or, good, bad, up, down, left, right, and really embracing just the paradox of 
the it's not about the chocolate it's about the chocolate yes well thanks for mentioning that because it is a confounding phrase when i don't get the chance to explain it <laughs> and what i mean what i mean is is that I must be laser focused on the quality of our chocolate. I'm liter literally nibbling on our Zamora Amazon bar just now as we're talking and wow. tasting it. Um, and and if, if I'm not just laser, laser focused on this chocolate being the absolute best that we can make it and just the best tasting direct chocolate in the world, if I'm not focused on that, then the before I know it, all I'm thinking about is feeding kids at a school in Tanzania mm. and I've lost the sight of my product. And so when I say it's about the chocolate, what I'm saying is, is I have laser focus on this quality. It must be awesome. And people need to want to buy it. I hope people buy it because they think it tastes great. You know, if I, if I had, if, if, you know, if I, if my chocolate tasted like sawdust, um, somebody might buy it once because of the story and they think, Oh, that's cool. You know, Sean's doing some cool stuff. I'll buy this piece of sawdust and chew it up and I probably won't buy it again. But if it's awesome, they're going to love it and they're going to buy it and they're going to share it with their friends. And if they like the story and it's meaningful to them, that's even better. But what I say, it's not about the chocolate. It's not about winning awards around the world for the quality of the chocolate. It is about the opportunity for me to have divine experiences at work. Mm. I mean, That's where cool. there are times, not every day, not <laughs> even every month, but I have um, in my job at work seen heaven. And I'm mm. not saying like I had a vision or that was somewhere. I'm saying that I saw it happen to be in Africa. And I, I, you know, but, and now I know to look for that. Well, that's not about the chocolate. If we're feeding over a thousand kids a day in, in Tanzania and the Philippines, that's not about the chocolate. It's about how do we have relationship with these students? How do we make sure in a partnership um, that they are fed and not that we're the great white savior. So that mm. is not about the chocolate. And so what I'm, what I'm trying to encourage people to think about, because this, this phrase applies to everybody, man, yeah. it applies to your podcast. It applies to your business yeah. because it isn't about your business. It's, it's not about, this isn't about how many downloads of this podcast that you get. I, I've looked at your guest list. I've listened to your podcast. It is about this idea of having a conversation which might help somebody, mm. which is going to help somebody in their life. It's going to help somebody get, feel better, be healed. And, um, and because you've lived this life, because you've lived this story, and so when you're asking people questions and you're trying to learn more, you're trying to do that to bring that to the people who are listening to your podcast. So it isn't about the podcast, yeah. but it is about the podcast. And you want it to be awesome. Yeah. You want it to be well put together, well produced. So this, this applies. To, and, and so what I, I want to encourage people to do is to say, look, wait a minute. The, the resulting product or service that we generate is inseparable from who we are as people and as a little business. They're inseparable. Mm -hmm. And it's not woo-woo or religious or spiritual. It is it is a fact. Yep. And, I, and, and I, I believe that we could take the same cocoa beans, the same recipe, give it to somebody else, tell them to make the same bar, and it wouldn't be the same chocolate as ours because of who we are as a company. Yeah. And, 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 and there are other companies like that too. And so, and so that is this non dualistic approach. And of course there are other things that we talk about well, and, and that you just mentioned, which is the, the, the idea of profit and good works. Yep. Yep. You know, we, we think that they're mutually exclusive. They're not, no. they aren't. And we're living proof of it. I'm not getting rich off of this, but I have enough. And so th it, this can happen and it happens because we, we're, we're willing to embrace both of these things at the same time. Yes, it gets a little messy. It's not easy, but it's, but, but it's, a, it's a fulfilling day. Mm. I have a huge smile on my face, by the way, just talking about all this. <laughs> um, you know, and, and we haven't even mentioned this, which that tells me about you and your humility. Uh, for you guys that are listening, Sean's company feeds thousands of children not a year, not a month, not a week, daily. So, so when we talk about profit and good works, um, 
he, you know, I, I don't want to give it all away in the book, but he goes into these villages, um, profit shares with the villagers, helps revolutionize, resurrect families, villages. Uh, he, he's changing the health of people physically uh, with meals that are served every day. This is, uh, it, it's, it, it's such an amazing and beautiful story. Um, and so it's that's, that's this harmony of profit and good works and I love how you say that, like, the modern business must go this way. If, if, if you don't find a way to weave meaning into, along with profitability, you're going to be, uh, you're going to be fighting a battle for a long time. Well, not only fighting a battle, but um, Khalil Gibran, who I quote in the book, says that if you bake bread with indifference, you bake a bitter bread that feeds but half man's hunger. Wow. And so we must we must provide opportunities for people that we work with to to have purpose, mm-hmm. not indifference. Mm-hmm. And the thing about it is is that I also believe in a positive way that small business is a force for good. Yeah. And we don't need government to approve or disapprove or sanction or give us money in order to solve social problems in our neighborhoods and in our towns and communities, we can do it. Small business can and must step up to the plate in whatever small way that we can or big way and and say, we business people must and can help solve social problems around the world and that is one of the ways in which we will inspire people to business and to capitalism as a good thing, a thing that's worth believing in. And if, but, but if we don't do that, then we will see what we see now, which is divisiveness around our country, uh, uh, surrounding capitalism and surrounding business. And we, there are many people out there who are um, quiet voices who are trying to piece together this idea of what capitalism can look like when we're rolling up our sleeves and helping our neighbors. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent agree with you. Um, so you, you move into the book, uh, and you, and you talk about like these growth opportunities that you guys have had and experiences with whole foods and target and, and different things like that. And I read this to my wife as I was going through uh, and wanting to think about questions for this last night. And I, and before I read it, I said, we should be weeping after we read this sentence, uh, just talking about our own personal conviction for businesses and things that we do. Um, and, and so you talk about growth at what cost? And then you say this in the book. You say, we're really looking after a changed heart, interior peace, higher quality products, reduced debt, and so forth. This will transform us little by little, and that's the kind of growth we hope never ceases. Dude, uh, I'm like a sentence guy. When you, when you when you get a sentence right, like there's nothing better than just that sentence. Uh, it's a meal in itself. Um, walk me through that. When people talk about scale and growth, and you know, we hear if you're not growing, you're dying, and things like that. Right. You are. You've reeled it in within your company and you've gone, Hey, what about the transformation of our hearts? What about peace? What about not overextending ourselves? Um, that has to be an amazing way for your employees to have buy-in when, when their leader is leading with this conversation in lieu of, are we in the black and are we in the black more than we were last month? Right. Yes, and this is a great point because, and this is an extension of the discussion a moment ago about this um, non-dualistic approach because we do, because I open my books to the employees, we are looking at financial statements every week. Everybody in the company knows where we are financially. And it's a very easy thing for a leader to say, oh, well, we have enough or aren't these ideas nice? We're feeding children in Tanzania and the Philippines. We're profit sharing with farmers around the world. But if we don't treat our own employees with, um, if we don't treat them with utter respect um, and make sure that they are getting what they need and that we're paying them what we can and that we're paying them fairly, then we've ruined the whole thing that we've, we've taken the entire thing and made it out of balance because we're, we're not, 
we aren't treating them as we as we're treating the other people around the world. But this this idea here, let me tell this story because this I think illustrates it. So the kids I take um, high school kids from here to uh, Tanzania every other year to meet cocoa farmers. It's part of this program we've done for 10 years called Chocolate University. It's an unbelievable experience. For, we have an elementary program, a middle school program, but the high school program, the kids to get to go to Tanzania. And these are really wow. sharp kids. I mean, very, very type A, achieving motive. They're members of every club. And when we ask them in interviews, why do you want to be part of this Tanzania program and invariably all of them. And I've listened to many interviews. They say some variation of, I want to help the people of Africa and you can't see me now, but I'm air quoting, <laughs> um, help the people of Africa. Um, and so in the beginning of the program, I, I didn't have the confidence that I do now to really squarely address that question. And I tell them now I say, look, students, Yes, we're going to drill water wells, and we have done that. Yeah, we're going to deliver textbooks, and we're going to do these things. But your job, students, when we go to the Tanzania, to Tanzania, your job is to let your heart be transformed. That's your job, and that is much harder, much more challenging than raising fifteen thousand bucks to drill a water well or build some classrooms or deliver books. It's much harder for 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 this to happen to your heart mm. type A competitive, you know, five point GPA students. Mm -hmm. And now I can tell them that. And when they get there, they get it. And one of the students wrote me a note uh, this past year when she got back, and she said, "I realized that I need Tanzania more than Tanzania needs me." Okay, she gets it. Wow. Her heart was transformed. We stay in touch with these kids, and so that's what I'm saying. And here's the deal. If I had grown, you know, taken investor money, you know, several years ago or taken on partners to make the company bigger, then there is a distinct possibility that I would have delegated trips like this with mm. students to someone else. I wouldn't have had the opportunity and the confidence to be able to make this a, a centerpiece and anchor of our chocolate university program encouraging the people that I'm with to let their heart be changed. Mm. So this, and this, this, the story that I'm telling you of these kids, this is, this is what I'm talking about. And now it even has a double meaning because one of the most gratifying things I've ever done in my life, and I'm 56 and I've done a lot of things is to watch these students right before my eyes experience this just overwhelming hospitality that they don't know what to do with and meeting these farmers and seeing them, uh, seeing this movement of their soul right before my eyes. Wow. I get to do that in my job. Yeah. That's part of my, part of my work. Yeah. And that's what I'm encouraging people to think about is how do you, where do you, where can you, um, how do you in your work day incorporate experience with the divine. Yeah. yeah. That's that's where we become our true self. Well, we might as well do it at work too. And so that's that's why I'm saying I, the, the, the the deal is I'm not saying that all growth is bad and all scale is bad. What I'm saying is is that it's a it is an enormous temptation available to us 24/7 from all sides from the chamber of commerce, from investors and partners and sometimes spouses who, you know, or family members who want us to grow. And so if we can resist that, then I believe we enhance our likelihood of staying connected to human beings wow. and having relationship. I think that's what I think. Well, you know, the, the quote in the book that I had here is that you said, you know, if we scale, can we remain our true selves? And then I just wrote this note here on my notepad. What happens if you scale and in doing so, end up delegating your vocation. Like, that is a massive, massive idea that I hope our listeners, especially small business owners, wrap their hands around. Um, yeah, the you once you start raising money and getting investors and doing things like that, you're dealing with a whole different conversation. Um, yes, and, and then one of the things I know you talk about with other guests, and that you've that I know is important to you, and that is the present moment. That's right. And, yeah. and, and my, what I'm saying on this is that if we, if we can 
stay true to this, then there's a much greater likelihood that we can be in the present moment right here, right now. And um, otherwise we risk losing it. We, we, as you said, you know, I, and I, I think in that case, we, we could be, we could be lost. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's, that's a dangerous place to be. And we're, we're, that's the, I'm, I'm trying to um, minimize the possibilities of that happening for just me myself. Mm. Wow. So your book is kind of this, it's a playbook for, for small business owners. It's also this memoir on your self-discovery, your story of transformation, um, you becoming a brother of this monastery in Missouri. Um, and I, I, I was so taken by your vulnerability of sharing the story of uh, becoming a part of that brotherhood, which is really unique. I didn't, I didn't even know you could do this in a way. Um, and you, you talked about writing your own rule. And I think this is probably the, the, the best piece of gold that's available in this book. Um, because it's, I, I, I'm revolutionizing the way I live my days now, uh, after you mirroring this to me, um, from last night, prayer of examine with my wife, we've never done that. And this morning Mm -hmm. we said, this is a new ritual within our house and our children every evening. Oh, cool. Um, la- you know, yesterday morning, beginning lighting a candle, starting with Leshi, uh, you know, Leshio Divina. How do you say it? Leshio Divina. Well, people say it different ways. Lexio Divina. Lexio Divina. Or just yeah, praying God's word. That's right. That's, Started yeah. with that, but and then just weaving it through. This is a this is a practice. This is awareness. This is not just beliefs in our head, but this is how we say we're going to live our lives. You want to kind of, I know we probably don't have a lot of time to go down this, but the rule of Benedict and kind of the whole, this 1,500-year-old practice of saying, this is how I'm going to pray, this is how I'm going to study, this is how I'm going to uh, enjoy life, and this is how I'm going to work, and so forth. The rule of Benedict uh, really originated around 500 AD, and it's been governing monasteries or Benedictine monasteries around the world for you know, 1,500 years. Some say it's the oldest continuous um, management document in use in history, wow. and and so there's there's something to be said for it. Then, and so the idea that my Trappist uh, monks had for me was to write my own rule of life that is very very loosely. Re- uh, based on the rule of Benedict and then to have some accountability for that. And so what I try to say in the book is you don't have to be Catholic. I'm not Catholic. I'm an Episcopalian. You could be anything. You don't even have to be a Christian to write a rule of life. That's right. Um, and, and the, but the point is, is, is there this structure by which you can say, this is who I aspire to be. And, uh, again, and we, we've said this before, but is this a way for me to discover my true self daily, weekly, monthly? Yeah. And, um, and so, yes, there's some routine to it. And I believe that that's important. Um, and, uh, not, not, not that it becomes rote that, but that it becomes a place of peace and mm. comfort. Yeah. And, um, and yes, solitude is part of it. And, it, and, and again, this has a very loose application to the rule of Benedict, which governs, you know, how they, how these monasteries do business, how they sell beer or fruit cakes or cheese, and also how they treat each other and how they treat guests. Um, it's very specific. And, um, of course, um, these monks were who brought us Lexio Divina, as you said, praying God's word. Um, and centering prayer. And, um, and so they taught me how to do these things and are still teaching me. I mean, I am not a master um, by any stretch. Uh, I tell the story in the book that Tara Brock told on her podcast yeah. where this novice monk says, you know, when, how many years will it take for me to have a, a real encounter with the divine? And the, the abbot says, um, you know, it could take 20 years or it could take 10 years. And he said, well, what if I work harder? And he said, well, for you, my son, it's going to take 20. And that's me, you know, that's me. I'm like, oh, just show me, give me the list. Yeah. Tell me what I need to do so yeah. I can, you know, check Mark off the list. And that's yeah. my challenge. Yeah. And I talk about that, you know, the whole thing of being versus doing. Yep. And yep. Uh, that is a real, real challenge for me. And I'm sure it is for many of your listeners. 
um, to be, especially in this age of information bombardment, you know, it is so much harder to be than to do. And that, that's, that, that's my, my, uh, my work. Well, I mean, and even the end of this rule of life, uh, when you talk about what you're going to do daily and weekly, monthly and annually, I mean, you, you end with areas of special accountability. And for entrepreneurs, most of those are, I produce, therefore I am, right? <laughs> yes, you know, yes. like, you know, yes. um, look at what I built, look at what I've done. And I know my journey of recentering back into who am I at the divine level, um, that, you know, Zig Ziglar, be, do, have, and, and how, mm-hmm. how do you mix those three words? Um, this, this is huge. And so I know for some of us, especially people, when you want your life to count, you know you want to live with purpose, but you also know you want to, you're building a business and something's going on. The worst part of a day is when you get to the end of the day and you go, how did I get here? Like, what happened? Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And so I think Jeff Bezos calls it regret minimization. Uh, mm. like your, your rule of life will allow you, and, and I'm seeing, you get to the end of your day and you can you have that piece of saying, I'm glad I did, in lieu of saying, I wish I had. Yeah, um, I love that. And, well, and, I love the way you said that. And that, um, to me, that is what it what it means to live a life of significance and purpose, is to, to where you can say, man, I sowed my seeds. I, I know my business metrics, but I also, I've got some soul metrics. <laughs> uh, there's rhythm yes. and flow and, and solitude that, that has to be woven into the doing. Yes. And I say to students and I say when I have the chance, you know, if I was going to say one thing that I would like people to think about as business people and just people in this book is this idea of service to someone who needs you. Don't Mm -hmm. wait. You don't need to know. You don't have to wait until there's more NOI. You don't have to wait until there's more employees or until things are better in your family or in your life. I encourage people, please seek someone who needs you. You know somebody who needs you and respond to that, even if it's a coworker. And when you get to the end of the day, you're going to know that you've done something. Even if it's just listening to them or being kind to them, you will have found yourself in that service. And I say, you know, uh, we, we all requote Gandhi every which way, but you know, he said, if you want to find yourself, lose yourself in the service of others. Wow. That that is that's true minute by minute, you know, just just yeah. day by maybe it's our it's someone in our family or our sibling. And and I and, 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 and what I want to say to people is, is that this paradox, this mystery, I mean, Gandhi talked about it. Christ yeah. talked about it. Yeah. And that is, you know we 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 have this opportunity to serve and paradoxically it helps us that's right it 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 uncovers our true self and then we find great joy in it and so i believe that that's possible to for anybody in any station in life and no matter where they work or what they're doing to find this um, and it will lend dignity to dignity to their day yeah. Yeah. So good. The, uh, the soul's reservoir will be ready to receive once you start giving, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. it's there and there's the paradox. If it's, if, mm-hmm. if it's true, you better find the paradox. Yes, yes, <laughs> and if exactly. you can't, if you can't find paradox, then it may not be true. Um, right. um, wow. Well, man, I have, um, I've just loved this conversation. Uh, I, I can't say enough good things uh, about, this work for our listeners. I ask everyone um, this question, and it is, what advice would you give to your younger self? I, the, the, I'm going to dodge in lawyer fashion um, <laughs> and say that, the, well, I, I would say I wouldn't give any advice to my younger self, but what I would do is just I would give him a big hug. Mm maybe an uncomfortably long hug mm. to my younger self. And, and, and he might want to pull away a little bit, but I, I just hold on tight mm. and I would just give him a hug and let him know how much I love him. Wow. That's, that's what I would do. Wow. Wow. That is uh, just the sound of empathy and wisdom and kinship. 
and humility and love in that is, uh, I love that answer. Thank you for that answer. Um, so where do we find you? How, if we want to send people, I, I tell people, if you don't understand the whole bean to bar chocolate thing, you need to go on Amazon and watch the cooked episode. Um, where, <laughs> where they, I mean, not on Amazon, Netflix, I'm sorry. Mm-hmm. Netflix, yes, where yeah. you go and, and they have this whole breakdown on how actual chocolate is made. Not the Hershey stuff where it's like, mm-hmm. you know, 5%, whatever, and the rest mm-hmm. is filler. This is the real deal, bean to bar. Uh, askanosi.com is your business site. SeanAskanosi.com is your personal site. Mm-hmm. Um, Instagram, we can follow you there as well. Right, Instagram and Facebook. Instagram yeah. and Facebook, awesome. So uh, you guys, make sure you go support the good work that they're doing. Um, buy some chocolate for yourself, for your yes. friends. Ask an OC is uh, the place to do it. Um, Sean, huge like bro hug uh, through the through the <laughs> microphone. From, I feel it from uh, Texas to Missouri. Uh, I hope we can keep this conversation going. I, I, I feel like you are a necessary voice we need at the table, um, and a great great light. And just thank you for the beauty that you're putting into the world. Well, thank you. And thank you for what you're doing and for who you are. And I hope you'll visit me at the Chocolate Factory someday. I will be there channeling my inner Willy Wonka. We can make it happen. (laughs) All right, my friend. We'll talk soon. All right. Thank you. I hope you guys enjoyed this conversation with Sean. Make sure you go online, go to askanosi.com, buy some of their products, get his latest book, follow what he's doing. He is definitely doing good, true, and beautiful work in the world. While you're at it, would you hop on over to iTunes and leave us a review? We would love to get these conversations in the hands of as many people as possible. And by leaving a review, you help us do our little part on helping the world turn into a good, true, and beautiful place. And as you approach this week, may you pause by the orchid, listen to the bluebirds sing, and be love.